So here we are now, a hundred and some years later after that vision, a hundred and forty some years later after that vision and after that battle. And we're talking about the consequences of the things that we have uh, endured, the things that have happened to us because of that interaction with the Europeans and because of what we've taken on into our own culture from them. So that's at the crux, that's, at, that's the basis of, the, of today's discussion. And, and hopefully I'll, I'll try to make sense of it as, as the day goes on. So to sort of focus in a little bit more, let, let me define what I think colonization is. And other people, you may, you may not agree precisely, but hopefully generally you will. Colonization is to establish social, geographic and political control over indigenous people. Let me say that again. Colonization is to establish social, geographic, and political control over indigenous people. And that's what happened in North America. It happened, else, it happened elsewhere, as I mentioned, but we're talking about North America and we're talking about the Northern Plains uh, specifically. So I'm gonna touch on 10 factors and we'll, we'll, I'll delve into each one of those a little bit some of them more than others. And as Peter mentioned, at the end of each of these sections, I'll, I'll, ask, for, I'll ask for a question or two. Factor number one, and, and, and this is really not in, in, in the order of importance. It just, I just happened to list them because they came to mind, because they're all important or impactive. Factor number one is loss of land. In, by the mid 1800s, the Lakota and the Dakota and the Nakota controlled a very, very large territory to say the least. And here you're gonna to have to uh, help yourself and help me in the discussion by visualizing if you can, a map of the Northern Plains, especially as it encompasses with South Dakota, the current state of South Dakota in the middle and go up north to the southern, a slice of southern North Dakota, go west to essentially the eastern half of what is now Wyoming, and then part of southwestern Minnesota, a little bit of northwestern Iowa, and a little bit of the northern sli slice of Nebraska. That was a big territory that we controlled. We didn't own it. There were no static borders, but we controlled that territory because we lived off the resources in that territory, the water, the game animals, the wild plants, and so forth. That was, that was how we, we survived. And that area was larger than many European countries at the time. And within that area, we lived our lifestyle, basically, uh, all of us, all three components of the nation, the Lakota, Dakota, and the Nakota, were nomadic hunters. And we were nomadic hunters even before the coming of the horse. The Lakota crossed the Missouri somewhere um, probably in the late 1800s, maybe around 1700, no one knows for sure. But we crossed the Missouri and we kept moving further west. And on those plains, we found, um, obviously found the bison. We knew they were there because, or, you know, some of the people had ventured west and, and knew that, knew there was a wide open country there. But after we were forced out of what is now Northern Minnesota, we went west and we crossed the Lakota across the Missouri. And we discovered the wide open, virtually treeless plains. And so we, be, we changed, we, we had to change from a sedentary, hunting lifestyle in the forests of what is now Minnesota to a nomadic hunting lifestyle in a wide open country of the Northern Plains. And of course, wide open country invites movement. One thing you get to the top of one hill and in a distance you see the top of another hill. So just out of basic human curiosity, you go to that next hill to see what, what's beyond that. And the biggest resource 
that really help to form our identity and solidify us as a nomadic hunting culture was the bison or the buffalo. And the buffalo moved. They were nomadic as well. So in order to take advantage of the resource, we had to move as well. So when Europeans came and they began to make inroads, literally and figuratively, uh, and they began and their settlements grew and forts began to pop up all around our territory. One of the effects was they restricted us. Uh, so we lost and we began to lose that land over time. We began to use, lose the resources. So loss of land was the biggest, was, was the first, one of the first factors. All right, the land began to diminish. Now, if you, if you, look at a map of South Dakota North and North Dakota today, most of the Lakota reservation and most of the reservations are in South Dakota with one in North Dakota, one in Nebraska and Minnesota and so forth. And that land base had drastically reduced. So we certainly have lost a lot of land to say the least, to say the very least. And and that restricted our lifestyle. It changed our lifestyle. Uh, and, and to make a long story short, we went from nomadic hunters to essentially farmers. And, and, and you know, the, the, the consequence of that loss, of that gradual loss over a period of decades is still with us today. And, and, and all you need to look at is, is to do is look at any map of those states, look at any plat map of any reservation, and you'll see uh, it, it looks like a checkerboard where there is native land or Lakota land next to white owned land and so forth. So, so it's, you know, the loss continues. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm sad, to, it's sad for me to say that it's still happening. Um, any questions about the first impact? Professor Marshall, there's a, there's a question in the chat that says, didn't Sitting Bull tell them not to take anything of the long knives because if they did, it would affect their descendants? And that's from Catherine yeah. Eagle Turner. Yeah, Turner. absolutely. That was one of the, that was part of the warning. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out because, and it, and it certainly is affecting us today, isn't it? I mean, you know, we, we're still contending with what happened then. And, you know, that, that aspect of history isn't just relegated to 1876 when that vision occurred. We're, we're still feeling the effects of it today. I see a um, start of a post from Julie. Julie, if you have a question, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, yes, sorry, um, I hit send accidentally. I was curious about the history of coming from Northern Minnesota and just um, what I've <clears throat> learned is that Lakota people have been connected to this area and you know the Black Hills since the beginning of time. Um, I'm just wondering how that that history kind of um, squares with the history of coming from northern Minnesota, like you were talking about, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, in the, I'm not personally so so much worried about squaring anything, one story with another. Uh, there are all kinds of creation stories, uh, not all kinds, but we have several. Uh, we emerge from the Black Hills. We're connected to the Black Hills. We certainly are. I mean, there's there's no denying that spiritual and philosophical connection to the Black Hills. The fact that we lived in a forest environment uh, is part of who we are. And there's one story that says to make, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it as short as possible in answering your question. There were two groups of people that came together. One came from the East and one came from the North, probably out of Canada. And those two groups came together in what is now Northern Minnesota. And over a period of time, formed an alliance, and out of that alliance eventually emerged, emerged th 
three dialects of a parent language. Languages merged, people merged, they intermarried. And there were probably relative newcomers to that area and there were other native indigenous groups and there was some conflict. And then when the French came along and uh, had firearms and traded for firearms, traded firearms to the other indigenous groups, then that's what caused us, that's what drove us out. And, and you know, as far as, as, far as the, the stories of us having a connection to the Black Hills, that's, just, that's exactly true. We do have a deep connection to those, to that sacred place. And it's not my duty, it's not my place. And certainly I don't have the, the knowledge and the wisdom to square anything, you know, one, one story with another. Uh, suffice to say that with any culture, with any group of people, we all have our origin stories. We have, sometimes we have more than one. So let's go on to the next factor in the, in the obvious effects of colonization, and that is loss of language and culture. And that's, that's a sad fact. It, it is. Uh, it's a very sad aspect. It's, it's, it's part and parcel of who we are today. Uh, I've read surveys, I've seen surveys, I've read surveys on a couple of reservations that, that say that the number of first language Lakota speakers are probably down to less than 2,000. I know on one, one reservation it is, I don't know what it is overall. I don't know how many first language Lakota speakers there are in total on all of the Lakota reservations that I can tell you, but I know it's not a lot. And all, many, most of those first language speakers are my generation. We are in our seventies and older. And we learned our language from our parents and grandparents uh, who learned it from their parents and grandparents. Uh, my grandparents were born around 1900 and before my grandparents on both sides. And so that meant their parents were born around 1880 and before. So we have, my, my generation has that, has a direct connection to the form of the language that was spoken in 1880 or so. But because of the effects of colonization and that, that speaks to some of the other factors that I'll touch on later on, boarding schools being one of them. Um, language was lost a little at a time, something more with each generation. And now we're in the third or fourth or fifth generation since the inception of boarding schools. And, and um, the majority of, well, let me put it to you, there is not a majority of first language speakers. And when you lose language, one of the things that happens is you lose a connection to culture. So again, that's, that's one of the effects. Uh, you feel more distant. It all, it, it all has to do with identity, a sense of identity uh, as an individual, a, a sense of identity as part of a community. Uh, that identity is still there, but it, it, it has more meaning when one, one can speak and understand one's own language. When I heard stories in Lakota growing, uh, growing up from my grandparents on both sides, all those stories were in Lakota. And it wasn't just my grandparents, it was that generation of people that they were friends or, or with or related to that had a lot to tell. And, and they told all of those stories, they gave all that information in Lakota. So that's how I heard them to be, when I was a child, when I was four, five, six and older. All those things I heard or listened to were spoken in Lakota. Not so much today. I don't have that same ability to speak to my grandchildren, the ones that I do, in Lakota, because first of all, I, they don't understand it. And part of that is it was my responsibility. I didn't take the initiative to teach them, but there were other circumstances involved that, that contributed to the loss of language. And that, that, and one of those, of course, was the school systems and boarding schools. So that's the second, the second factor is, is the loss of language. So if you have any comments or questions about that, maybe one or two. I 
if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and jump right in. I don't see any comments in the chat. Okay. Otherwise, um, we'll move forward. Okay. All right, factor number three uh, is, is the impact of foreign diseases. And this was, this was devastating. There, I've heard, I've not seen any number of estimates of how, what percentage of the indigenous populations across Turtle Island were affected. And there's really no way to know precisely. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard percentages of upwards of 60 to 90%. And that's probably true. That's with, probably within the ballpark. We don't know how many uh, indigenous groups there were. We don't know how many indigenous tribes there were. We don't know how many exactly how many indigenous, what the indigenous population of, of Turtle Island was, North America, was when the Europeans got here. So there's no way to know numbers. But suffice to say that uh, some of the stories that we've heard over the years um, give us an insight that the diseases decimated populations. I think in 1849, the Pawnee were reduced by half. And I think they had a few, their population was a few thousand, maybe eight or 9,000, and they reduced by half because of smallpox. Um, and the same thing happened, the same thing happened in, uh, on the Northern Plains in 1837. A steamboat coming up from St. Louis was offloading supplies um, on, at, at all the landings and it landed at what is now Fort Randall called Whetstone Landing and went further north up into North Dakota. It landed at, stopped at Fort Pier, went further north and all the way up in Fort Union in North Dakota and it offloaded supplies, food, clothing, blankets and so forth. And Probably because of the landing at Whetstone in near Fort Randall, um, the, the Lakota people who went there to trade for some of those items contracted smallpox. And over the course of that summer, the stories say uh, probably upwards of 2,000 people died from smallpox. But the effect up further north was even more devastating to the Mandan. Mandan were a small tribe of just a few hundred, as far as I know. And they lost most of their people to that same disease, to smallpox. So diseases have had that kind of impact overall across North America. And, and probably we wouldn't have had that as part of our history if Europeans had not come because these were diseases totally new to us and to the point that, that our medicine men, our, our healers did not know how to mitigate, mitigate those diseases. And I think, you know, and, and that's, that's really all we need to say about that. It's, it's the, the, the overall effect was the loss of population. Um, and, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. Let me see. Professor Marshall, the, yes. um, Catherine had a comment just to sure. say that there were two epidemics of smallpox in the, to the Mandan. Two epidemics. Wow. Okay. Yeah, thanks for telling us. And the other, the other effect it had uh, was, it, it, you know, the effect of it was it, it, it forced people to capitulate, uh, you know, sort of to, to get into in the mood to give up, unfortunately, because of the devastating effect of losing so many people, losing family members, losing whole communities. Uh, it caused a sense of helplessness uh, feeling defenseless, because obviously the medicine men could do any, couldn't could not do anything to mitigate it or find cures for it, and because of that, it caused uh, a lot of social upheaval within communities. Uh, that, you know the kind of upheaval that wasn't there before. 
And the one factor that I think we, we, we need to consider is that it caused people to question their belief system, to have this kind of thing happen to entire families, to have an entire village wiped out by smallpox, by any kind of disease, be it cholera or anything else. Um, and to question what we're all about, to question what we believe in, uh, it gave an opening to Christianity. And, and they certainly seized, seized on it. One of the other factors is, is uh, the change in diet and lifestyle. From about the mid 1800s on, um, the government where we Lakota were concerned uh, because of treaties, it was a condition of the treaties, they provided what they called annuities, uh, blankets, clothing, food, uh, and that included uh, sugar, coffee, lard, beans, rice, and meat on the hoof in the form of longhorn long cattle. Uh, and that had other effects as well, but Probably, and I'm not a dietitian, I'm not a scientist, but probably the three that caused the most problems were flour, sugar, and lard. Because we did not have refined sugar in our diet. We certainly did not have lard. We certainly did not have flour. And our systems were not used to processing that. And the consequence of that is obesity, uh, shortened lifespans, and eventually diabetes and cancer. And diabetes is still a, is still a very severe problem uh, to this day. Uh, I have friends, I have relatives who uh, have to go to dialysis or have had amputations and so forth. So, so again, it's a consequence that we're still experiencing because of what happened way back in 1860. And believe it or not, we continue to have unhealthy diets. We still eat the potato chips, we still drink the soda, we still eat a lot of refined sugar. All the things that are not good for us, we insist on, we insist on eating and having. As far as change in lifestyle, remember we talked about our ancestors, ancestors having a nomadic hunting lifestyle and moving villages frequently from one part of the prairie to the next. And that nomadic lifestyle occurred even before the coming of the horse because of the bison, because of the openness of the land. And after the coming of the horse, we just kept doing it. We went further, the horses carried bigger loads. Uh, but within that lifestyle, there, there was a lot of, obviously there was a lot of movement because the human body is designed for movement. Our body is mostly legs and we're meant to walk, we're meant to move, we're, we're meant to run and so forth. But when, when our lifestyle changed, because of the diet, then that contributed even more to health problems, health problems. So again, these are, these are things that, that you know, we don't think about in terms of having any connection to who we are now, but it certainly had a, had a uh, inception in the past. The other thing is we went from round lodges not perfectly round lodges because they were sort of egg shaped as the floor plan. We went from round lodges to square houses. As a culture, the circle was very critical to us, even today. If you notice, and I do sometimes in many instances, when native people get together, not just we Lakota, but native people get together we naturally form a circle. We stand around and talk. And our, you know, our, our dancing arbors are circular. 
and you know, and and because the natural environment that we based our belief on, the circle was a part of of that process. The the cycle of life from birth to death, from birth to childhood to adulthood to old age and then death, and the four directions are a circle. So the circle was critical in, in the way we conducted ourselves, in the way we thought, in the way we moved. If we, if we are participants in a sweat, we go in one side and we come out the other. Uh, but when, when that changed in, the, in the probably 1870s, when, late 1870s, when, when they moved us up to South Dakota and separated us on reservations, um, some of the people kept their lodges, but others began to build houses according to, according to how the whites were building their houses, square, and square log houses. And it was, I've seen photographs of people with small log houses with their old lodges next door. But we went from the circle being important philosophically, spiritually, and practically to the square being a dominant shape in our culture and it is today it is today and it affects how we think so it's not just a matter of changing one kind of domicile to another it changes the way we think it changes the way we relate uh to one another and and, and to to life in general to the environment and so forth so that, that was, those are some of the effects of, 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 of change in diet and lifestyle. Are there any comments or questions? I'm not seeing any in the, in the chat, but if anyone has a question now, feel free to unmute and jump right in. Give folks maybe five or ten seconds to find the unmute button if they <laughs> right. need to. Right. Okay, there's one that popped up in the chat, Joseph. Um, okay. It says, "What would you say this was intentional? The, these health and diet impacts." That's what um. Right. Do I think it was intentional? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it is, but certainly um, when the government promised annuities, they gave us what was part of their diet, what they ate, what they used, uh, what they wore. Uh, and now that's all part of the process of, of that. Later on, we'll talk, in the next session, we'll talk about the colonizer mentality. What's good for them had to be good for us. And at that time, there was no lot, there was no knowledge or insight into how that would affect us as far as our health was concerned. And when you, when you consider that our ancestors ate no refined sugar, the only, you know, if they tasted anything sweet, it was with the fruits, uh, the wild fruits. And, you know, sugar was, was totally, totally foreign to us, obviously. But lard also was, you know, the, we used rendered fat in, in preparing some of our food, but not so much, not to the extent that lard was used. Uh, and, and flour certainly wasn't part of our diet as far as we people, on, us people on the Northern Plains, it was not. We didn't grind grains to make flour. Uh, and, and, that, and that reminds me of, um, you know, uh, Indian tacos, as it were, Indian tacos is is one of the is our favorites among us. Certainly, me, I, I like Indian tacos as much as an and fry bread. And and I don't know if you ever wondered how fry bread or skillet bread came about. I asked some people years and years ago. Uh, I think one of them was my grandmother. And how, 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 why do we make fry bread? How did, how did you learn to make fry bread? And of course, her answer was, I learned from my mother. But overall, 
keep in mind that um, winters on the northern plains are very harsh, and sometimes the annuities that were promised by the government didn't get to Fort Robinson or wherever our people were. And sometimes, and, and, and they would bring up, drive up or bring up by rail the cattle, the longhorn cattle. And sometimes they didn't get there at all or on time. So there were lean times. There were, you know, some of those supplies ran out. Some of those food annuities ran low. But it was the women who wisely set aside a little bit of corn, a little bit of flour, uh, a little bit of beans for hard times. And someone early on learned that if you just mix flour with water and put a little bit of grease in the bottom of a of an iron skillet, of a cast iron skillet, then you could make bread. You could make skillet bread. And someone also figured out that with a little bit more lard, then you had fry bread, fried bread. So those foods that we like now, I mean, there's, there's, I, I like nothing better than uh, a, a really nice bowl of soup with kabubu bread or skillet bread. Uh, I enjoy that, and I, I, I have fond memories of my of my grandmothers and my mother making that for us uh, as as part of a meal. And it, it, but but what we forget is it had its origins in hard times, and it was the women who really saved us because they set those those things aside, those ingredients aside and use them only in hard times. So what my grandmother was telling me and more than one grandmother told me the story in one form or another that those, uh, those foods, the fry bread and, and skillet bread came out of hard times. So, you know, uh, it might be something for you to consider the next time you have a piece of fry bread or an Indian taco or a skillet bread. I certainly do just about every time. Mr. Marshall, I have a couple comments and then a, a question if, okay. if you think you have time for them. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, there's a comment from Catherine. She said, the federal government always wanted to make us like them, hence assimilation. And then Travis says, killing of the buffalo was intentional. It was a military tactic to subdue Plains tribes. Also, do you believe that disease was introduced purposely through infected trade goods by some? Okay, yeah, uh, the killing of uh, buffalo was certainly intentional, um, but we'll, but I hear I was talking about the annuities, because um, somebody asked if that was they intentionally gave us those foodstuffs to to cause problems, and that was where I said I don't know. Yes, the killing of the buffalo was definitely intentional, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. And what was the other comment? If you can remember. Um, it was, it was just saying that the federal government always wanted to make us like them, hence assimilation. Of course, of course. Um, assimilation, again, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but yeah, they, they, they wanted, uh, they wanted us to adopt their lifestyle. They wanted us to be like them in the way we talk and in the way we prayed in the way we lived, certainly. So most, if not everything that, that uh they brought to us was from that mindset in other words what they were saying to us is if you're like us if you think like us if you do like us then you will be better people you're elevating yourselves you're giving up what you are as lakota as indigenous people as 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 a group of people that we think meaning them they thought we were lesser than they were so yes, in that sense, yeah, everything they did was was to to make us into versions of themselves. Uh, there's a there's a long question here from Diani. She says it's backtracking a bit, but Lakota language learning now for many of us is as a second language. This often takes place in classrooms, books, online, etc. But I also think of, about how it's done through English language thinking. I hear my uncle and others complain about how you speak the language differently. Can you speak to these ideas, challenges of learning the language through an English lens, 
as well as the differences in how it's spoken? Are there right. some important things to remember or strive towards as we try to reclaim and practice language and culture? Well, first of all, I know that there are efforts on several reservations to, to offer language courses, offer uh, language immersion programs, and that's great. Yeah, it, any form of preserving the language and teaching it to the next generation, I, I mean, I'm in favor of it. I, I just concluded four days of, of uh, teaching a small group of people here. I'm, I'm, for those of you who know, uh, I'm in Melk's Camp. It's the easternmost community on the Rosebud Reservation. It's just uh, west of the, about 40 miles west of the Missouri River and just a few miles north of the Nebraska border. It's along Ponca Creek because the Ponca people used to be in this area as well. And it was established way back in the 1800s by Chief Milk. So the, the artwork you see behind me, that's not a halo emanating from my head. That's painting on a buffalo hide. So I'm sitting in the office of Lakota Youth Development Incorporated, which is a nonprofit. And I sit on their board and they were, they were kind enough to let me use their facilities. So this is where I am. And I spent the last four days <clears throat> doing a, a, a Lakota language immersion um, project with the staff of, of this of LYD, Lakota Youth Development. And in the space of four days, the students, the participants came away with uh, more, of a vo more of a vocabulary than they thought they would. They're able to hear and understand sentences and phrases in Lakota. They didn't know that on Monday. Um, so any kind of effort, any kind of a process is critical and is important and it should be done in order to reclaim our language. I applaud it all. However you go about it as a teacher, as an instructor, as a mentor, do it. Do what works for you. Don't think anyone else's method is better or don't think any other method should be the way. You do it the way you see fit because the, the ultimate objective is to revive the language. And, and so to stem the loss, so that when my generation is gone, my generation of first language speakers is gone, there'll be a new generation of people who have learned it as a second language and can keep the language alive. That's the whole point to all of these programs. Now, I happen to approach it by using English language skills to build Lakota language skills. That's my method. Uh, we could do it in total, with totally Lakota immersion. If that works, fine. If, if that process works for anybody and you're, you're adept with it, that's great. But my point is we need to revitalize the language. We need to stop the decline in its usage. We need to bring it back and we need to teach it to as many people, young or old, as we can, and it and it uh, behooves those of us who are who have some teaching ability to do that, to offer to do that, and and, uh, and I'm willing to do what I can, whether it's a small group or a large group, to to make sure that the language doesn't die out. A quick follow up is someone asked if you've heard of the Awokshapi. Lakota language learning app? Uh, yeah, somebody told me about it. I haven't seen it myself, but I have, somebody told me about it. And, but I don't know, I know very little about it. Okay. And then there's a little bit of conversation about, I, I think people are just trying to follow up on this idea of infected trade goods. Mm. Oh yes, trade, yeah, yeah. Smallpox, infected blankets. And right, and, 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 and and there are documents that that, that European Euro, Euro American documents that, that prove that a lot of that, some of it was obviously intentional. Uh, there was a, a British general named Anher, Amherst, and I think a, a college or university is named for him, where he deliberately introduced infected smallpox blankets 
infected with smallpox to native communities with the intent of causing illness and death. And, you know, the, the steamboat that came up the Missouri River and offloaded supplies, uh, you know, I, I think it probably was intentional. Uh, but it's hard to prove with the documentation available. But suffice it to say, some of those efforts, maybe more, a lot of those efforts were intentional. Okay, um, someone just shared a link about some reporting on the Hudson Bay Company and some infected blankets. Mm -hmm. so there's a link in the chat. Right. Well, but that's all the questions at this point. Okay, okay, cool, all right. Well, let's go on to the next factor. And, and uh, as I said before, I'm, I'm far from being an expert on, on any of these, but I do know that these were factors in, uh, as a consequence of colonization. And this factor is alcohol and drugs, alcohol to begin with. Alcohol came early on. It was, it was part of the trade goods. It was, it was offered early on. And it had a severe impact early on. Uh, we had very, very little resistance to it, obviously, because it wasn't part of our culture. Alcohol was not. Uh, and of course, you know, people became addicted to it even then uh, and craved it. And the kinds of problems it causes, we're all sadly too familiar with it. And we do know that in this day and age, uh, rare is the Lakota family that is not affected directly or indirectly by alcohol and drugs. So my point is uh, that is a consequence of colonization. Uh, one aspect of a culture was given or provided to another, uh, to an indigenous culture, and the, the consequence was wrecking havoc to individuals, to families, and entire communities. And it's an issue that we still wrestle with today. Now it's, now it's gone into drugs. And, and certainly uh, methamphetamine is, is a horrendous, horrible thing that is happening, not just to us, not just to the native communities, but across this country and probably across the world, but certainly across this country. And it has had an impact on us. It has, it has been, and it is, is devastating. So I just say this just, just to point out that alcohol is definitely a consequence of, of colonization. And again, you may have opinions on whether that was in, introduced intentionally uh, or not, and it probably was here and there, or more than we know. But what I am pointing out is that it was, and still is, uh, a very negative factor in our, in our culture, in our lifestyle. So I'm not going to take any questions on that because I'm not an expert on, on that whole issue. I'm just to the point that I know that it's, it's a factor. It's a consequence of colonization. Um, so the next factor is uh, attack on spiritual beliefs. Um, I grew up... Um, near near White River, South Dakota, for those of you who, who know the area. It's in South Central South Dakota. And my grandmother, my maternal grandmother was a devout Episcopalian. And my grandfather went along because he decided to. And they were both very gentle, uh, very spiritual people in that sense. And they would have been spiritual people if they had not been Episcopalian because just that, that's the kind of people they were. Uh, but I remember, and, and early on as a child, uh, my English language skills were not very good. But I can remember, and I can still visualize a couple of Episcopalian priests that would come maybe once a month to congregation, south of white river and give do the holy communion and so forth and and he he was all he would always deliver his sermon in english and i don't know how many how much of the congregation of maybe 20 or 30 people you know 
understood precisely what he was trying to say. I didn't, I certainly didn't because one, because I was a child and two, you know, my, as I said, my English language skills were not that, were not that good. However, what I do recall is the tone of his voice and the look on his face. And I do know that those were, that a lot of that was very condescending, very paternalistic, as if he was talking to a room full of children. And, and there were some children there, but most of them were adults. But it was as if we were talking to a room full of children, talking down to them. Um, that's what I recall from, from my boyhood days. And later on, um, people will talk about what he said, you know, not, not each time, but I would sit around and would, people would sit around after uh, the service, especially if there were activities afterwards. And then of course, everybody spoke Lakota and there was, it was a chance to get together and socialize after the church service. And some of those people will talk about, well, well, why did the priest, why did that man, why did father such and such say what he did? What did he mean? Um, why did he talk to us that way? And while he was delivering his sermon, everybody listened respectfully. Um, they didn't make eye contact with him. They just sat there and they, they listened respectfully and there was no reaction. Some people would nod and they would, they would just, because they were listening. But afterwards when they talked about, that's when it took issue with those who understood what, was, what he was saying, didn't like what he was saying, didn't like the way he was saying saying it and what they didn't like was him uh in, in, in several instances this one priest denigrating lakota beliefs denigrating lakota spiritualism and and they were and that's what they did early on missionaries were quick to condemn and keep in mind the story i'm telling you about this priest occurred around 1950 so take it back a century or so when, when the missionaries and the first uh, Christians began to come among the Lakota, they were quick to condemn. They were quick to ridicule. They were quick, quick to dispute uh, Lakota spiritual beliefs and, and our practices and our rituals. And the sad part about it was uh, the Lakota were powerless to refute any of that. And even when they tried, it didn't make any difference. Uh, they, they couldn't say, well, you're wrong. Uh, you know, what we believe is, is, is better than yours or anything. And it, because that's what they were saying. What I'm giving you is better than what you have. What, what I'm giving you, what I'm telling you is better uh, than what you believe in. You should give up those ways because they're not good. That was the message. Uh, and it was delivered all across the Northern Plains by a, a lot of denominations, not just Catholics, but other, other types of missionaries as well. And so the consequences of those, that, it caused the Lakota people to question or doubt themselves and doubt the validity of their beliefs and to doubt medicine men. Because medicine men were looked at not, not uh, not only as healers, but also as spiritual people, spiritual advisors. Uh, and the more you ascribe validity to this new message, as it were, then the more you're apt to take, to look askance at what had been part of your belief system, part of your parents' belief system, and part of your community's belief system. So that little that little seed of doubt came along with uh, every time there was ridicule, every time there was condemnation uh, and so forth. And so that's how it began a hundred, hundred and some years ago. And furthermore, the Lakota people accepting Christianity or appearing to um, cause further doubt. Because people would say, well, why, why is that family, why is he or she, or why is that family now going to church? Why, why are they going, why are they not 
participating in, in our ceremonies. Why are they not doing this and why are they going over there? So that, when one, when, especially if it's a prominent family or a prominent individual goes over to the other side, as it were, then that causes further, cause further doubt. And I think, I think uh, Vine Deloria Jr. said it best and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember specifically the words, but in, this, in, this, in essence, he said, in the beginning, we had the land and they had the book. And now they have the land and we have the book. And I couldn't, I couldn't say it better myself. And again, I mean, I should say, I'm not denigrating Christianity as a belief system, as a religion. Uh, what I'm talking about is the effects of Christianity on our culture and on our belief system. Uh, I'm not saying if you're a Christian, you shouldn't be a Christian. I'm just saying this is what happened. This is part of the record. This is part of the, the history that we share as native people and European peoples. That's, that's a fact. That's a cold hard fact. And that's, that's, that's precisely what I'm talking about. I'm not by any means saying that Christianity is bad. What I am saying is some of the things that did were bad in the name of Christianity. I'm sure you have some questions about this or maybe some comments. I'm not seeing any in the chat, I think, Georgia mentioned back in the section about addiction that you mentioned, she said, I work in the addiction field and I find reintroduction to culture life-saving. That was a comment she had. Oh, then. that's it's a good point. That's a good point. Yes, reintroduction to native culture, to Lakota culture, whatever culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it re reestablishes connection. It reestablishes identity uh, because identity is important. And I see a, a hand raised from B. LeBeau. Go ahead and unmute and you can ask your question. Or I can unmute you if that's easier. Let's try that. I'm back to watch this. Oh. Um, Christianity. Um, I get this is where I get rusty on my words, but she fits that um case of where she got converted, I think, in the 70s, and then that's just how she's raised the mm -hmm. generations after that. Mm -hmm. But now as a um 30s adult now I want to I'm, I strayed away from that years ago mm -hmm. um, so how do I, I this is something I've been struggling with how would I <clears throat> excuse me still respect her views but also let her know that I'm trying to go our original ways and mm -hmm. whatnot and it's just something I struggle with because I know that's yes. what she she's getting old now mid um, sure. mid 80s and she's, that's her used to a way of life. Right. Well, you know, I mean, we all have choices. I mean, we're faced with life choices just about every day. Uh, and, and joining anything, being a part of anything, whether it's a sewing circle or anything else, a church, a, a belief system is, is a choice as long as you know what you're getting into and as long as you uh, do it in a way to, to become a, a better person. Uh, I have never said Christian beliefs are bad because I don't believe that. Every, every religion has a, has a basic set of core beliefs. And as long as those beliefs are there to make an individual better, to make a society better, then that's really what it's all about. Um, if, you go, if, you, if, if a person is gonna believe something, uh, a set of principles, a set of values, then 
belief should be followed by living those beliefs every day, day in and day out. You can't forsake those beliefs just because you don't like something or someone, or at least you shouldn't in my, in my purview. Um, there's, there's, there's always something positive and uplifting in every philosophy. And especially as far as it is, can uplift humanity, can uplift in us as individuals, that's good. But live what you believe and be comfortable with it. Own it. If this is who you intend to be, then be it without denigrating anything else or anyone else. I'm more impressed with somebody who will live what they believe and not say a word about anybody else's way of being better or worse. If you're going to believe something, then live it. It's as simple as that. Whether it's us as Lakota people or, or any other belief system. Uh, and my, most of my relatives are either Episcopalian or Catholic. One of my grandfathers was an Episcopalian deacon. He spoke Lakota. Uh, and he never ever said that what I believe is better. He was not one of those preachers that said that. He was not one of those Christian missionaries or Christian uh, ministers that said that. He didn't say Christianity was better than your way. Ne I'd never, if he said it, I didn't hear him because he didn't believe that. It just happened to be something he decided to believe in, he decided to follow, and he did it really well. And therein is the example. Um, and I've known people who, who aspire to traditional indigenous and Lakota beliefs who follow them without denigrating anybody else, without you know, criticizing any other set of beliefs. And really, that's, to me, that's where it should be. If you're going to believe in something, then live it and let others live. And if we do that, if we live and practice the best of what we believe, then hopefully the world will be a better place. And that's really, that's really what we're all about, is somehow to leave this world a better place. Yes, I believe that also. And she's, if her beliefs make her content and at peace, then I'm not going to disrespect that yes. or go against exactly. that. Exactly. Because it's because it's too far down. She's invested too far into it now that right. it's our, she's found a way of life in it and it's okay mm -hmm. for her. So, but at the, somewhere deep down inside me, my spirit, I still do wish we could just do like a, a reverse <laughs> conversion. Right. right. <laughs> but, but it's like you said, just, you know, I, I respect her beliefs. Sure. That's really her new her new belief, <laughs> I should say. Uh huh. Thank you. Uh huh. Well, uh, let's take about a ten minute break if that's possible. Um, it's according to my clock on the wall. It's twenty five minutes after the hour, so let's get back together in about ten minutes, if that's okay with you all. That sounds great. So we'll great. do a bio break. We'll be back in ten minutes, folks. All right. Great. Thank you.
All right, it looks like Mr. Marshall's getting settled back in and it looks like quite a few of you have stuck with us with us through the break. I want to <laughs> thank you all for um, being here again and thank you to Mr. Marshall um, for being our sacrificial lamb as far as <laughs> as far as uh, doing our winter camp over um, in a virtual setting. Really appreciate that. Um, but I want to go ahead and hand it back to you and if you're ready to get going for the, the second half of today's meeting. Sure. Uh, and it looks like we have a little bit of time. So um, just uh, on the chance that anybody has any follow-up questions to any of the topics, um, I'll be glad to try to answer it before we get started again. There's a, there's a comment that says there CC is in a hundred percent agreement. Um, reintroduction to our ceremonies has been credited with a lot of successful healing for our, mm -hmm. for our Oyate. Right. And um, someone, Barbara asked if you have any advice for their Lakota students um, in high school um, in general, it looks like just any, any advice for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't. For, I agree with the, the first comment on on uh, you know the, the the revitalization or just going back to uh, our ceremonies, our our rituals, our you know sweat lodge and so forth. I mean that's 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 our way. That's that's been the basis of our spiritual strength and spiritual practices for who knows how long. And I think it's part of their, of our identity as who we are, where we fit in the world. And I think if Christianity has done anything to us, it's taken away our sense of belonging, our sense of place. Um, and all these things that have happened that we've been talking about have done that. It's, it's affected, it's, it's eroded our identity and for some of us, and it's it's eradicated it entirely for others of us. But I think if we if we patiently get back into who and what we are, and if you want to do it with both feet, that's fine too. Uh, that's where it's at. If to go back to those ways, I mean, we can't go back to living in a teepee. We can't go back to chasing buffalo on the back of a horse. Uh, none of those things will happen again. But what is at the core of our culture is our values and our beliefs and if we know them and if we live them then we're going to get stronger as as a group of people as 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 a lakota people um and as far as imparting advice to high school people um uh, you know i mentioned that early on that i'm 75 years old so chronologically i guess i could be considered an elder but i don't feel like an elder I don't feel wise. I am opinionated, as I said to begin with. Uh, but uh, you know, just just something that I've always said, whenever I have the opportunity, to young people, don't give up. Don't you ever give up on yourself? Don't you give, ever give one give up on what you're doing? Going to school at least high school and finishing it is very, very critical. And once you pass that, you need, you need to find your path in the world. But don't give up. I, I wanted to be a writer way back when in high school. But there was no one around who could say, okay, that's a good idea, or this is what you do to become a writer. But, but, the, but the impulse and the dream never really went away, it was always there. I wanted to be a storyteller like my grandparents and like those that generation who were very good at that sort of thing. So that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't until later on, probably around the age of 40 that I really decided, well, I'm gonna do something about this. I'm going to write something. I'm going to write an article, I'm gonna write a short story, I'm going to do something. And, and so it started with a few, a couple of publications and a couple of magazines, and then it got, it grew from there. But part of me never wanted to give up on that idea, on that desire to 
say something about whatever was on my mind, certainly as, as, as a native person, as a Lakota person. And if I had, had given up on it, then I wouldn't be sitting here today acting like I know something. It wouldn't, if I had given up on that, that impulse, that dream, I wouldn't have been able to do the kind of things I've been able to do uh, and meet the kind of people that I've met over the years since I started publishing books. I've published uh, 20 books to date, 21 and 22 are in the works. And that is possible for me to say because I didn't give up. Even when other people, and sad to say people in my own family were ridiculing or denigrating my desire to be a writer. So if I'm gonna give any kind of across the board advice to anyone, especially young people is please do not give up. Thank you. Right. Um, there's a question from Keith Braveheart. Um, and he, there's, there's a Lakota word here that I will do my best with. He says, how Joseph, thank oh. you for all your words and thoughts. I am interested in our Lakota Ohunkaka. Ohunkaka. Do you have any recommendations for resources? Oh, geez. Um, Ohunkaka means uh, it generally stories, um, stories of the past. Uh, my grandparents would say, I'm going to tell you a story uh, of the past. Um, my best resource that the, the were, were I learned a lot, a lot was from old people, elderly people who know those stories. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, a few publications that have versions of those stories, obviously probably written in English. Um, but I don't have, you know, I don't have that list at my fingertips. But there are publications that, that have uh, Lakota stories. Uh, but, but my advice is to go to the elderly people who know those stories and ask to hear them. They'll tell you, take along some tobacco, take along an offering of some kind and ask to hear them. Uh, so that's, that's the best source is to the people who know the stories. One more question before we get started. Um, there's, oh, here comes a, so there's a kind of a comment from CC, it says, I'd like to recognize Mr. Marshall and thank him for sending books to the classrooms for students to read and discuss. I'm grateful that he chose to write books that we can utilize with our Lakota students. It certainly goes a long way to start having those wonderful conversations and analyzing how we are who we are. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone that you want to Come off of mute and ask yourself. Nothing else is popping okay. up. Okay, great. All right. Yeah. I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> oh, there you go. Go ahead, CT. <laughs> Um, this is Cece Bikro from Ogallala, um, mm -hmm. Lakota, from your neighbor. Right. Um, I was just wondering what kind of books are you working on now? Oh, I'm working on now? Um, yeah, you could tell yeah. us. Okay, I'm working on uh, a couple of them. I'm working on one that is a sequel to one that came out, I think, three years ago called In the Footsteps of Crazy Horse. In the Footsteps of Crazy Horse is a story of a, a, a boy and his grandfather. And the boy is being bullied because he has blue eyes, even though he's Lakota. And his grandfather, in order to help him, takes him on a road trip. And they go to all the places where Crazy Horse 
lived and hunted and grew up as a child, all the famous places that are associated with Crazy Horse. And he tells him stories of Crazy Horse at each juncture, at each stop, uh, to give him a sense of identity and to give him a, to his grandson a sense of identity and a sense of uh, uh, who he is and to, to learn to stick up for himself. So that's the whole point of that story. And there's a front story of, of, of uh, a Jimmy McLean and his grandfather, Niles. And there's the backstory of Crazy Horse. And every time they stop somewhere and the grandfather delves into Crazy Horse, then there's a, the backstory comes up. The sequel to that, I have, that I'm about three quarters of the way through is called uh, Horse Dancing, Horse Dancing. And it, the front story is about Jimmy again and about his family adopting a younger brother. So there's that issue and how Jimmy and his new, new brother adapt to that situation. At the same time, they are asked by their grandfather to help care for a really badly injured horse. And in the process of doing that, then the grandfather once again relate stories to both of them about how the Lakota came to have the horse and what the horse meant to them culturally and spiritually. So that's what I'm working on now. And uh, I'm, I'm working on a book about colonization, as it were. I'm, I'm beginning to outline that. And uh, also I'm, I'm working on another one called um, the, the, the Cultural Philosophy of Lakota Bows and Arrows. So you know, that's, that's what I'm working on now. Great. Thanks for that sneak peek, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Again, if you can't figure out how to raise your hand, go ahead and <laughs> un unmute and jump right in. <laughs> And if there aren't any in the next few seconds, you're welcome to just to, to okay. keep going. Yeah. In that case, we'll, we'll press on. So we have about, oh, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four more factors or topics to cover. And we have plenty of time to cover them. And the next factor uh, is boarding schools. Uh, both government and parochial boarding schools that had their inception back in the uh, uh, late 1800s. I think the most notable one is the Carlisle Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, I made a trip into that area, oh, about eight or nine years and was treated to an informal tour of the army base that is still an active army base at Carlisle. And the buildings that were used as part of um, that industrial school are painted white, as I recall, to identify them as, as, as the old school. And all the records that were part of uh, the Carlisle school were given to a nearby library. So if you have uh, any questions about Anybody that might have been there, if you know of anybody that's been there, it's online. You can look up records online. Um, so that was the most notable one, Carlisle Indian School. And of course, we now know there, are, there were boarding schools all over the country uh, on just about every reservation, uh, both run by uh, basically the Catholic Church and by the US government. And the whole purpose as, as somebody brought up a, a little while ago, was to intentionally take away our culture. And the, the boarding schools was the main instrument of that. Um, my father told me a story. My dad it, it died in 2001, but he, he is part French. There's French ancestry in my, in my paternal side of the family. And my dad has sandy colored hair and blue eye, bright blue eyes. But he spoke Lakota fluently. In fact, that, that ability surprised a lot of people when he was a child because they thought he was a little white boy. 
So he surprised more than one old lady because he responded to somebody's question in Lakota. So you can imagine how that went. When he was in the seventh grade, he went to Rosebud Boarding School, which is which used to be just east of Mission, where where the uh, uh, Sinte Galeska University campus is now. That's where the Rosebud Boarding School was at one time, and I think there's only one building left that is that was part of that old old campus. When he was in the I, I think sixth sixth or seventh grade. He broke a rule. He broke the cardinal rule. Do not speak Lakota on premises, on the ground. And he was caught speaking Lakota with someone else. The first time he was caught, he, they took him to the principal's office, wherever it was, and they made him kneel on a two by four in front of the principal's office for an entire afternoon. Now that doesn't sound like much, but if you don't think that it's not much of a punishment, then you try it. Get a two by four, put it on the floor and kneel on it for at least an hour without moving. And you'll see how much, what, you know, how, how, how bad that punishment was. And as, as my dad put it, it wasn't fun at all. So you can imagine how bad it was for him. Unfortunately, he got caught a second time. And the second time he got caught, they took him down into the basement of one of those buildings, probably that main school building. And they, they tied, they put cords around his thumbs and they tied him up to a water pipe, over that water pipe. And he had to stand on his tiptoes to prevent, to, in order to avoid dislocating his thumbs whenever he relaxed and he hung then there was the real danger of dislocating his thumbs. And he said, that hurt. I can imagine it did. But the whole punishment was to certainly discourage him from speaking Lakota. Uh, he was smart enough not to get caught again, but he didn't stop speaking Lakota. I have a friend, a relative who tells a similar story in that she went to a boarding school, a parochial boarding school, and she broke the cardinal rule of speaking Lakota. So the teacher, in this case a nun, put her in a, the closet that was part of the classroom, and it was dark in that closet, she said, and the only light came from the bottom of the door in that closet she was in. So she laid down, she spent the whole afternoon in that closet. She laid down on the floor just to get fresh air that came in from the bottom of the floor. So, and, and there were worse punishments than that. So these schools, both the government and the parochial schools were the main instruments of assimilation. Assimilate means to bring someone into and change them into something else. That's different than acculturate. Sometimes I hear people say, well, they acculturated you to, to, to living like us, to thinking like us, to speaking our language. No, no, it, they assimilated. They did their best to take away what was, what identified us as native people and mainly our language. And you all probably know the stories. And if you don't, I'll tell it. Uh, of when, when the first students uh, got to Carlisle Indian Industrial School, their clothes were taken away from them, their traditional clothes were taken away from them, and they were given uniforms. And then they were taken, the girls in the girls' dorm and the boys in the boys' dorm, and they were given haircuts. Their braids, their long hair was cut off. I was part of a film project several years ago, 10 years ago now, uh, 15 years ago called Into the West. It's a six part miniseries about uh, essentially two families, two, native, two families, one native and one white. And I think episode five is more or less about the Carlisle Indian Industrial School and what happened to those students when they got there. And it depicts that very well of the haircut, uh, the change of clothing 
and the the rule against speaking Lakota and uh, one in one scene one young boy is has a, a bar of soap stuffed in his mouth because he he slipped and said something in Lakota so he's punished with with that <clears throat> but if you ever have the opportunity I don't know what one one would get that miniseries but it's called Into the West and it's episode five and it it depicts how the children were taken away from their families on the reservation, loaded on, onto wagons to begin with, and then taken to uh, a railroad, and then and then taken all the way across the country to Pennsylvania, and what happened to them there. It's a sad story, but it's part of who we are. It's part of our history, and so that's how that that's how uh, those boarding, boarding schools were used. So if you're going to assimilate anybody, you don't give them a chance to say yes or no. You force them into it. You do this or else. You learn this language or else. You wear these clothes or else. You cut your hair or else. And the other thing that they, they did when they got there was they were they received uh, European names. And the, again, the movie depicts it very well. The kids are lined up and they, they go to the board or what, whatever is printed on the wall and, and they get to choose their name, big deal. So they get to say, they go up and they say, okay, I'll be George. So after that, they're George, whatever their, their family, whatever their name is. And in the story uh, of the protagonist in this episode, the boy who is a young boy picks the name of George and so then his name known thereafter is George Voices That Carry because that was his Lakota name. And that's exactly what happened in those boarding schools in that era where everything that was obviously an aspect of identity individually and culturally was taken away from them, both boys and girls. And People tell stories of the shock they felt when their hair was cut off, when their long hair was, especially the boys. The girls' hair was trimmed, but the boys, they were given short haircuts, just like white men, white boys of, of the day. So those, that, that whole process, that, those, those institutions were, were the main instrument of assimilation, forced change, which is different than acculturation. If you acculturate yourself in my purview to something, then you choose what you're gonna adapt from that something new for you to take on yourself. Whether it's a piece of clothing, a certain style of dressing, uh, a way to, uh, to use language or whatever. You choose, okay, this is, I'm, I like that. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna wear that. I'm gonna do things this way because I like it. It appeals to me. It's not threatening. So there's a big difference between assimilation on one hand and acculturation on another. So anytime somebody says, well, you people acculturated very well, I say, no, we didn't, we were forced. You know, my, my, my grandparents and, and their parents' generation were forced uh, under threat of punishment to change, to learn to speak English, to go to church, uh, to learn about the Bible, to learn your Christianity, they were forced to do it. And again, that's, that's a tough part of our history, but it is part of our history and we need to know it. And why boarding schools? Because children were easier to convert than adults. Children are easier to threaten. Children were easier to intimidate than adults. So of course they, they went after that generation. And then what happened subsequently then those children grew up to be adults, got married, had a family, and maybe as a consequence of their experience in a boarding school, their skill and ability with luck, especially with the language is, has been diminished, was diminished. So therefore they didn't, didn't have the ability likely to teach their children to teach Lakota and at the same time, they didn't want their children to go through what they just went through at the boarding school, being forced to change, being forced to speak only English in every circumstance. They didn't want their children to go through that 
that tough process, that, that demeaning process. So the consequence of all of that is that the following generation knew even less, uh, Lakota, the language even less, and therefore consequence to that had a less of a connection to their culture. So you can see how that, that goes. So now we have in between that, the inception of all those boarding schools back in the late 1800s to now, we have two or three generations where, where the Lakota language diminished significantly each time. I was fortunate to grow up with grandparents. They spoke nothing but Lakota in the home. And so that's, that's how I learned it from them just by being around them. And, and my, my parent, my mother, and certainly my, and her, bro her brother certainly knew English. And so I learned a little bit from them, but I didn't learn enough to be, to have idiomatic skills to be able to carry on a conversation. But uh, if it hadn't been for that upbringing, upbringing I would not have uh, Lakota as my primary language. I have, um, I come from a large family. I have uh, 10 siblings. Uh, one of my younger brothers died, uh, but they didn't have that same opportunity. They didn't have my grandparents there to teach them. And certainly my parents knew Lakota, but I think my parents were in that position. Well, if I teach them Lakota, then they're gonna have a hard time in school. So I think that was probably part of the reason they didn't teach my siblings how to speak Lakota. Some of them do now, some of them know a little bit and can understand it, but they do not have the conversational skills uh, that first language Lakota speakers do. Um, aside from the past four days when I spoke a lot of Lakota to my students here, the only other person I speak Lakota to uh, with some regularity is my mother, who is now 92. And I, we speak only Lakota to, to each other. You know, necessarily when we, we don't have a Lakota word for the English word, then we use English. But other than that, we converse in Lakota. So we help, we help each other in that sense. Um, when children lose language with, from each generation, they lose that connection to culture and, and, and more and more, and they lose that connection to that sense of identity about who they are. I mean, we know who we are uh, uh, biologically and racially, we're Lakota, but what does that mean? What does that mean? I speak a certain language, I have certain beliefs, I grew up in a certain way, so that identifies me as Lakota, but much of that has been lost in the, in the subsequent generation since, since, since the late 1800s. Um, and so it goes on. But as somebody mentioned earlier, as we talked about earlier, there are efforts now, there are programs now on several reservations to revive the language, to teach it to children and to anybody, to anybody who wants to learn. And, and, and the more of that we do, the better. I mean, that's, that's, that's the one really solid hope of keeping, maintaining our culture, maintaining our language is to speak it, to learn it and to speak it. Um, Obviously, there, there will come a point when, when there will be, cease to be the first language Lakota speakers, my generation. Once we're, once we're gone, that, that, that generation of us having learned it first there will be no more. Hopefully, that doesn't mean that there will be no more Lakota language. But see what the boarding schools caused. That was their, that was their reason. To, to strip language, to strip culture away from us. And, and a common saying that was attributed to that period of time and attributed to boarding school was to kill the Indian and save the man. To kill the Indian and save the man. I know some of you have heard it before, but it bears repeating because it was carried out. It took away from that person's identity, that part of, which made them, him or her, Lakota or native. The language, the, the denial of 
uh, the rituals and the practices and so forth. When I was about seven, seven or eight, uh, I went with my parents to St. Francis Indian School, which is here on the Rosebud Reservation. And it is still there. Then it was a Catholic school. And I, like I said, I accompanied my, my parents to, because some of my cousins, my father's older brother's children went to school there. And we waited for them, I think it was over Christmas because the gymnasium was decorated. We waited for them in a gymnasium and we were gonna go home over Christmas break. And so my female cousin, I think her name was Marianne, came and, and ran up to her parents. And I didn't know what I was expecting. I, I, I think I was sort of expecting her to say something in Lakota because she spoke Lakota, I knew it. But when, when she ran up to her parents, she said, long time no see, which was a common greeting in those days, a common phrase, long time no see. And, you know, it bothered me. And I asked what that meant. And so my, one of my parents explained what that meant, long time no see, I didn't see you for a long time. And for years and years afterward, that little episode of a few seconds bothered me. And after a while, I sort of figured out why it bothered me. Because those words coming out of that girl's mouth, my cousin's mouth, did not seem natural to me. It signified something different. It signified a change that I could not understand. And that sort of thing started with the early boarding schools. And this was in 1952 or 53. And it was still going on. They were still forbidding Lakota children to speak Lakota on, on school grounds. So the, the boarding schools were a main instrument of assimilation. And depending on what your perspective is, it looks like they did a darn good job. And we'll talk more about that later. Any questions or comments? There's there's a question from Georgia, just wondering um, why the the children that are buried at Carlisle haven't been repatriated. Oh, or that I I don't know. I really don't know. I I had thought that there was a movement afoot some years ago, a few years ago, to bring them home. And I think if I'm, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you know, maybe a few have been repatriated or brought home. Uh, but I'm, brought, I'm glad you mentioned that because when I visited Carlisle Indian School, we, I, I think there was more than one gate. But the gate we went through, one of the first things I th saw as we were driving up to the gate was a cemetery to the left. And our host said, and that's, those are the graves of the Indian children. And it was a cemetery and I, it had somewhere between, I, I mean, I didn't have the time to count, but I looked and my estimation is, is that it had somewhere between 60 and 100 graves, headstones. Um, and, and I, I wish they, they have, they should be taken home to wherever their home is, be it here in South Dakota on any of the reservations or any other part of the country. Um, they should be repatriated, they should be taken home. So there's someone who asked some questions on um, our Facebook stream. Uh, and he mentioned that he's in the process of finding the best ways to learn traditional language. His name's Jared. And his question is a little more broad. He said, what are the main aspects of our indigenous culture the settlers feared the most that made them want to take it away? Um, I don't know if it was so much that they feared any aspect of our culture. It was just in their nature to take it all. And we were in the way. Uh, they wanted the land we lived on the land in order, in order for them to possess the land 
then they had to move us out of the way. Uh, certainly, we gave them reason to fear us when we faced them militarily, because more than one tribe demonstrated quite aptly that uh, we were capable of defending ourselves. And, and I think, you know, they did learn that later on, that we were not pushovers. And, and just as an aside, um, where the Northern Plains is concerned, in the mid 1800s, from just the plains, from mid Texas all the way up into Canada, that central part of the country, which included Texas, Kansas, uh, Nebraska, uh, you know, Oklahoma, and, and Dakotas, and North Dakota, and on into Canada, Saskatchewan, I believe. That's the, the Great Plains. Um, there were probably about 60 different tribes. No one knows exactly what the population is, but I'm guessing that it's somewhere between 200 and 3,000, 200,000 as a native population of all those tribes. At the same time, however, the population of the United States was 25 million. And as I said earlier, to begin with, we don't know how many different tribes there were in North America when European man came. We don't know in terms of number of individuals. Some say as little as 3 million, some say as high as say 90 million. Some say, oh, there were only 500 tribes but I, I think there were more different groups than that. I think there were probably closer to 2,000 different tribes. But in, in, the, in the whole interaction scenario where, where the Europeans came, pushed into an area and forced natives to defend themselves, that's when we, we clashed physically, militarily on the field of battle. And in most cases, we, we, we uh, uh, accounted for ourselves very well. And that was a fear factor for them. But as far as any aspect of our culture, them fearing, I don't know if that's necessarily true because they didn't, they looked down on us. They thought we were, we were a lesser kind of people, but they did want the land that we were living on. And they did everything to get us out of the way, be it militarily, be it at the, at the, at the negotiating table, uh, be, it, be it the treaties that they brought for us to sign. Uh, they did whatever they could uh, to get us out of the way to the extent of, you know, killing us. But again, that's part and parcel of, of, of what history is. We've got one other kind of more general question here I want to share. It's from okay. Sam. And he says, I'm a non-Lakota teacher on the Pine Ridge Reservation teaching English language arts to Oglala Lakota middle schoolers. What can I do to perpetuate Lakota culture and values and halt the legacy of boarding schools while still teaching English? What sort of English language education would you want for your grandchildren? Well, necessarily we have to speak English. That's part of survival. Um, as far as as him using his platform, whatever he, whatever he teaches, is to infuse as much of the Lakota culture naturally or organically into what he's teaching, be it art or anything else. It's there. There are people who have information about the culture that he can use to help those children understand who they are and what they are. And there are more teachers who are doing that. And I'm, I'm, I'm one Lakota person who is eternally grateful for that, for a teacher being taking that extra step to, to use Lakota in, in Lakota culture and aspects of culture and history in teaching whatever it is they're teaching. So I'm, you know, I'm glad he's doing it. I'm, I'm really, really glad to hear that. And as far as English, um, there, there's a story in near the town where I grew up of White River. And this was again around 1950. I remember coming to town and, and most people, both native and white, came to town on Saturday night, Saturday evening, especially in the summertime. Because that was the time to come and get your groceries and whatever, and then see your relatives and friends. And it was a social occasion as well. And the main street of White River 
it's not very long. It's only it's only about two blocks long. And on the main street of White River, there were just two or three stores, a post office and so forth. And in the front of all of those stores, all those buildings were benches. And people would sit on a bench and visit uh, for an evening. And then when it got dark, then people went home. Now that was part of, that was a tradition in those days, as I recall. And there was a, a man, his name was Frank Perry. He was a nice man, I liked him. And the reason that I brought him up is because he spoke Lakota. He learned how to speak Lakota. And he was fairly fluent enough to walk along and greet his Lakota friends and stop at each bench and carry on a conversation. And he certainly, he knew my grandparents. And so my, and my grandparents knew him. And when he stopped, they would talk. They would talk a lot. They would visit back and forth in Lakota. And the Lakota people were always uh, very complimentary that he could, that he learned to speak their language. And I, I don't know of anybody else in the town of White River that did that at that time. But let's flip that to the other side. Let's, let's look at those Lakota people who were sitting there on those benches almost every one of them was bilingual. They had to learn English in order just to get along in this new society. English was necessary. It is necessary for us to know English and to know it as well as we can, to write it as well as we can, because one of the things we need to do is communicate about who we are and what we're doing, what's happening to us. Some of us do that for a living. Some of us do that because we feel like it, because it's necessary. And so we need to have that skill to be able to impart that knowledge, our perspective, our voice to those who are not Lakota, to those who are not indigenous. So learn the language, learn it well, um, because it's 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 the way that we use it. We have we have to we have to. That's it's part of it's part of continuing survival. That does not mean you cannot be bilingual or trilingual. Keep in mind that back in the day, again back in the mid 1800s, when our Lakota ancestors were allied, they were allied with the Arapaho, the North and the Northern Cheyenne. So those people. All of them were trilingual. They knew how to speak. If it was a Lakota person, they knew how to speak Northern Cheyenne and Arapaho. If they're Arapaho, they don't know how to speak Northern Cheyenne and Lakota and so on. So it, it was nothing, it's nothing new for us to know the, more than one language. Some of us know English and Lakota. Um, I have friends in California who have children that are now 13 and 14. Uh, but when Damon and Erica, the kids, grew up, they, they still speak four languages. And the first time that I met them, they were like five and six years old and they were multilingual then. Their mother was Austrian, their, mother, their father was Polish. They spoke English at school and they learned Spanish from their Spanish speaking nanny. So they spoke four languages. There's nothing that says we can't learn our own language, that we can't learn French. I'm trying to learn French right now because that's part of my ancestry. It's kind of going in fits and starts, but, but yeah, we, we, we know we need to learn English. We need to learn it well. So, so we can communicate as effectively as we can. Thank you. I don't. I don't see any other questions. Um, if, if you're ready to move forward. Okay. All right. Let's do. Let's do. Um, so the next topic or the next factor is uh, something that I that I <laughs> that is with us as a consequence. I don't know when it started. Probably earlier than we probably realize. Is or two things. Object objectification and wannabes. By objectification, I mean, pure and simply, sports names. 
the Atlanta Braves, the Washington Redskins, um, the Kansas City Chiefs, and, and, and others, you know, that and not just in their, in their professional ranks, that the, the Cleveland Indians, the Atlanta, I said the Atlanta Braves, and a lot of high school and college uh, sports teams have, have names representing uh, Native groups and Native tribes. I think the Florida Seminoles is one example. Um, there was a college here in South Dakota at Huron, South Dakota. I don't know if it still exists, but at one time they used the logo uh, of, a, of a Native man in a, with, in a headdress and they called themselves very proudly, I might add, the Huron Scalpers. And they thought that was a good thing to do. Even though some people said that, no, that we, we take, we don't like that name because that implies, you know, a, an aspect of our character that of our, of our identity, that isn't true. We didn't, you know, we didn't start the whole process of scalping. And of course, you know, the, the, it goes down to the military names um, helicopters. There's, the, 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 there's a kind of a helicopter that's called an Apache. There's another called the Sioux. There's even one now called the Lakota. And the whole point is that they, they do that, one, because they can, and two, because they say they're honoring us. Well, maybe in their minds, they are. And in that sense, that's probably a good thing. But then what, what they don't do is they don't listen to our reasons as to why that we might consider them offensive. And if you don't already know, then I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to talk about why the name Redskins is offensive to native people. Is on the East Coast uh, uh, among the Dutch and the English, uh, as far as I know, and as far as the documents are read, bounties were put out um, for the scalps of native people. And the prices varied. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, somewhere I saw an old poster that said, five cents for the scalp of an adult Indian, two and a half cents for the scalp of a child. And those scalps were called, in many instances, redskins. The scalp was the, the proof that you, you sent, as they put it, sent, a native, sent an Indian to the happy hunting ground. So that is a very, very horrendous part of our history that most of us who know the history as native people are reminded of when we see redskins. And, and now I, I think that the, the, the Washington football team is what they're called now because they dropped finally after all these years of, of us speaking up, especially notably you know, three or four people speaking up again uh, about it over the years. Uh, and really they didn't pay attention to those people. You know what got their attention? Money. Because the person uh, or, the, or, the, or the company that owns the stadium or the rights to the name of the stadium, I think it's FedEx, took issue. They, they said to the owner of the Redskins, well, maybe this is not such a good idea. Maybe we're going to take back our sponsorship if you don't consider changing the name of your football team. So the man didn't listen to our impassioned arguments, our very logical arguments about history and why it was offensive to us. But when his bottom line was threatened, then he made a change. And that's as far as I know the story. So that's object, object, objectification, where we're made into something uh, essentially to suit suit them in one way or the other. Uh, it happens and it's still happening. And there are some institutions that are digging their heels in. No, we're not going to change. Um, the university of one of the universities in North Dakota were called the fighting Sioux. And people were, we were, some individual were, and tribes were after them to change their name. And I think they finally did after a lot of contention. So it's, it's starting to happen. Uh, 
it isn't where we think it should be. Um, but it's it's a, you know a, a shaky step in the right direction for the for the owner of the Washington Redskins team to at least listen to his wallet and, and change the name. Um, the other thing is is uh, something called uh, wannabes, and simply put, uh, a wannabe is a non-native. Who wants to have the who wants to have the veneer of being native, and a lot of them sold themselves to the mainstream society as such. They made native they made the mainstream society believe they were native. Uh, there was one notable one. Um, he appeared. I, I forget his name now. He appeared on a Johnny Carson show several times, and I, because I saw him. And he appeared in a lot of television commercials. Um, trying to remember his name, maybe some of you will know. Uh, and he was Italian, but he had the image. He looked like a native person. He had the profile. He had the long hair. Maybe it was a wig. Um, I can't remember his name, but there were uh, many of those, and and one or two have crossed my path individually. Uh, there was a man who, and I'm not going to give his name, but there was a man who befriended me and said he was a member of such and such a tribe and that he had relatives and he didn't grow up on a reservation, but uh, uh, he was still nonetheless, nonetheless a native. And someone else was the one who said, you know, that person uh, isn't who he says he is. And when I started checking into it, uh, it turned out to be the truth. Um, so there are those kind of people who who pass themselves off. Uh, and they want that veneer of being a native person, but they don't want to, to, when it comes time to being native, when it comes time to own the tough part of being a native person, uh, to standing up to the racism, um, and, and the, 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 the erroneous history and those kind of things, they don't. They don't want to do the hard work of being, uh, dealing with the reality of being natives. And I don't know if there's any other name for them. Years ago, uh, decades ago, somebody or other came up with the name of wannabes. Oh, that person is a member of the wannabe tribe. He wants to be, I want to be a native. And so that's a consequence of, of uh, colonization because again, because, because they can, because somehow they, they, they think they have the, the right to do that, to present themselves as native people. Um, it's, it's, it can be funny in a sense, but it really isn't. Uh, Cause some of those people uh, brand themselves as natives, give themselves native names, and they produce art, or they produce music, or they dance, or they give lectures. So they're misrepresenting themselves, certainly, and most of them don't know Native culture. They're not well versed in it enough to make art that's real, or make music that's, that's genuine, or impart information that's accurate. And so they, they in that sense, they do more damage and again, it's 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 a way of, in my, in my way of thinking. It's a way of ridiculing our cultures uh, to be wanting to be native just on on the outside, and not really deal with the with the with the re, where it's at, where the where the real aspects of being native are. Maybe some of you run across somebody like that. Any questions? Joe, several people uh, thought of his name, Iron Eyes Cody. Iron Eyes Cody, that's who it is, yes. Yeah, look him up. I'm sure he's on Google or anywhere else. Yeah, Iron Eyes Cody. He looked native. He did. He really looked native. And and he spoke a good game. He was on Johnny Carson a few times. He was on television commercials about the environment and um, you know, saving the environment where, where a, a glycerin tear would roll down his face. So I remember that very well. And, and 
I at first I thought he was, especially because of the name Iron Eyes, Iron Eyes mm -hmm. Cody. And there were um, a couple questions that are related to each other, and you touched on it. Someone asked, "What do you think about non-native artists depicting native life, cult culture, and imagery?" Mm -hmm. And the other um, from Diani. Whitehawk says there are a number of folks doing this in the arts and education that are doing this. Uh, and lately, some have been using Junca Lakota as a way to speak their identity and then gather financial and opportunistic support for their careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is a very sensitive topic, very sensitive area. Uh, what do I think of it? Uh, not much, uh, because I know I've seen firsthand um, I mean, a, a good artist is a good artist. I mean, I, I appreciate good art as much as anybody else does. And there, there are times when I've seen art that depicts some aspect of native culture or a portrait of a native person or the image of a, of a lodge or a longhouse or a cliff dwelling or something. And I always ask, I wonder if that artist is native. And I know that some of those artists want to portray us for who and what we are. And their heart is in the right place as far as helping us to, to present the reality of being natives. And if they're doing it with that, with that intent, I, you know, it, it, it's probably not as bad as blatantly passing oneself off as a native artist and making money at it. Um, back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there were a lot of non-native writers, historians who wrote about native culture, native history, and enriched themselves at it. Um, and that's still going on. Uh, and certainly, as a writer, I'm, I'm free to write about whatever I want. If I wanted to write a, a book or a series of book about European history, I certainly can do that. If I wanted to write a book or a series of book about European culture, who's going to stop me? No one. So there's that aspect of it. We have a right. We have, we have the, the worth all as writers or as artists to portray, paint, present whatever we want. But what are we doing when we do that? We're not, we're not speaking from the perspective of the inside of a culture, from the inside of a native person, from the, that inside view of what our culture is. Uh, you don't have the, the insider's knowledge to present a, a, a true perspective. That's, that's where the shortfall is. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, you know, that native voice uh, in, in, in all things, books, and art especially. And if you look at all of the articles, all of the books, all of the documentaries, all of the movies that have been made about the Battle of the Greasy Grass, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, that's over 8,000 individual pieces, be they a documentary, be they an article, a scholarly paper, but an overwhelming majority of those and those that even purport to present from the native perspective are not by natives, only very few. And while there are facts that cannot be disputed by anyone on either side, the battle did occur on June 25th and 26th, that cannot be disputed. This many soldiers were killed. Custer attacked from this direction. There are those facts that can't be disputed. But I as a native person, don't know how the soldiers were feeling, what was going through their heads, what was going through their minds. Were they afraid? Were they, were they feeling superior to, to the natives that were there? Did they buy the propaganda at the time that said, as a white race, we're superior to the natives? Were they thinking that as they attacked? By the same token, any non-native writer can't begin to understand why the Lakota and the Cheyenne were gathering there and happened to be there at the greasy grass at that particular time. 
Only we know that, what the perspective is. Only we can, we can know what those people were feeling, why they were there. Um, so it's important to have all those perspectives. But I'm not going to write a book that pretends to understand what any of those soldiers were feeling. I can present the facts. I can say that among the seventh in in the seventh cavalry, there were probably about twelve different languages, and that hindered their performance in the field because not everybody spoke English, and that so that had an impact. So those those indisputable facts, but. I don't know how those soldiers are feeling, not by a long shot. I will, from the stories I've heard, from the other perspective, from, from, my, from my grandfather and because his father was there and I heard his story, I can talk about that story. My grandfather said his father told him he was scared out of his wits. So I can say that, I can report that. My great grandfather was scared to go into battle because that's true. So whoever we are, we need to present that voice. And, and that's, that's for art as well. And it's, it's, and it's uh, you know, I, I look askance at anybody who, who says I'm presenting the true perspective, be it art or true native perspective, be it art or otherwise, who is not native. Unless, unless some native person has allowed you, and then there's that into, into their family or so forth. Then there's that aspect of it, of, the, of that hunka. Well, I was adopted by this person. This person made me a relative so that, but that's, that may be so. That may well have happened. A native person, Lakota person might have taken this non-Indian person as a relative and that's called making, making a relative, a hunka. But does that somehow automatically by some magical process infuse into you the perspective of being native? Probably not. And as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't. You have to be there. You have to be part of it to understand where we come from as native people. Joe, there, uh, th this, this section has triggered a lot of comments, but I, right, bef at, right, bef right when you started this section, Sierra raised her uh, their hand, okay. and I want to make sure we don't leave leave them behind. So, Sierra, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, mitakapi ampeti washte. Ah, lakota ya oyate wawokia wii machiapi na yes washitu wasir tubuls i machiapi kshto. Um. Uh, <laughs> uh, oglala na oglash oglesha um, imata, huh? um, mm -hmm. but living in Kansas, uh, Ka Osage lands. Mm -hmm. So it's good to be here. <laughs> good. Uh, my question before uh, it was kind of lines of language, but now that the conversation has been um, unfolding, it's, and now I have a new new question. Mm -hmm. Uh, in in respect to the objectification, the romanticization that you've been that you've been talking about, mm -hmm. and so that's my thing. Like running running into uh, nowadays with the uh, mascot issues, and right. me being being Kansas, not too far from the Chiefs mm -hmm. uh, football team, um, and just having co these intense conversations around around uh okay so if you're a native if you're a native american you can speak on these issues but if mm -hmm. you're maybe it's just uh there's some conflict there with the uh, natives mm -hmm. that maybe just i mean people that find out they have some native heritage or uh but they haven't lived the experience like i have like from the pine ridge res and so having and speaking to that i can see in the chat too some people talking about pretendian mm -hmm. pretendians <laughs> we call right. them pretendians now exactly, not <laughs> exactly. Yeah, pretendians but, like, yeah. But like them speaking like, well, either they use the excuse of like, well, I was um, adopted or mm -hmm. I have a native friend I, and then they name from that person's tribe or sure. or in some retrospect, in some way they mention that and they use that as an excuse to say, mm -hmm. well, it doesn't bother me and, or I am part such and such tribe and it doesn't right. bother me. It doesn't bother so, me. Right. So it's like, how do we have the like, what else can I what are your thoughts on like how we can have more of a conversation to not just not change your mind, but like 
letting other non-natives and natives pe native people to like see that uh, th this is a right or wrong way of thinking like um just like how you mentioned with the r word the redskins mm -hmm. like there's history behind that and sure. but there are people that really that really don't mind that objectification they they, mm -hmm. they they're very proud to be a mascot right so, thoughts on that well i'm not one of those people who is proud to be a mascot yes me to neither any extent, to any extent um the only thing we can do is is speak from the from the experience of who we are, especially if we have lived on a reservation, especially if we experienced racism in any way, shape or form, especially if we've uh, walked the hard walk of being native in any way, then we have a perspective that, that those people who may be native, but haven't had that experience are lacking. And there are those people who are native who haven't paid much attention to that native side for whatever reason. And they haven't experienced the kind of things that some of us have. And, and so, I mean, as you know, if, if they've lived a native lifestyle, if they have native values, if they are cognizant of their native heritage and they learn as much as they can about it, that's one thing. But to say, well, I'm part, such and such, I'm one eighth or I'm one quarter this. And so therefore that gives me a right to, to have an opinion. And as far as I'm concerned, it's okay. The Redskins names is okay. I've heard that. I've heard people say that. And, and on the flip side of that is that Daniel Snyder, whoever owns a team and people like him will talk to only a certain number of people. And they say, well, these Indians over here say it's okay. But these Indians over here don't speak for everybody. And that's the other thing. You know, it doesn't matter how much uh, native heritage we have or own or how much native blood we have. We can't speak for every native person that's walking on Turtle Island because there are a lot of us and we all, we've all come from different tribes and our experiences are generally the same, but again, they're different based on where we are and what what time that we what period of time we lived in, so so I, I can only speak for myself. And and do as much as I can to inform, to create awareness. Why are we? Why do we find these things offensive as a group of people? I mean, people say, well, I mean, the, the, there's the Wyoming cowboys, and there are no cowboys that take offense. Well, fine, that's their that's their choice. <laughs> Our choice is, you know we don't like this and we have a reason not to like it and and if you if you want to listen to our reasons um fine if you don't want to listen okay that's your choice as well hmm. no question and to follow up on that there there seem to be several questions about specific instances the boy scout order of the arrow yeah cultural appropriation in the fashion industry Right, uh, white people learning Lakota language, uh, and uh, taking down of statues of Columbus. So those right. those issues have come up. If you have thoughts okay. on any of that, well, I have thoughts, but those those are some of the topics for the for the next lecture. Okay, perfect. So, so tune so. in for next Saturday at at noon Mountain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that's that's all the questions for now. Okay, um, I can see. Well, it's getting to be about uh, 15 minutes to the hour, and I don't want to launch into these, these, these other topics because I think we're going to run out of time. But as I said to begin with, um, the reason that I responded to your invitation, uh, to the invitation to do this was because I wanted to cause or create awareness. You may not always agree. You probably don't agree with everything I've said. Maybe some of you don't like what I've said, but there has to be awareness. You have to know what's real and it's what, what's not. Uh, a pretend Indian is not real. Most of us are. Most of us have known the hard side of being a native person in any part of this country. And that's because 
of colonization. Remember what I said colonization was, to control indigenous groups socially, politically, and militarily, to make themselves, to make us over into their image, so to speak. That's, that's the whole purpose of colonization. Not just that in itself, but because there's an ulterior motive to have the land, to have the resources that are here on this land. And we happen to be there on the land. So in order to have the resources, in order to have the land, that we need to be gotten rid of or changed to their point of view. And so that's really the whole point of, of colonization. And I guess I have a question for, for uh, anybody here who's native that is listening to this particular comment, has been listening to this, this first installment. I actually have a, a two questions. What language do you speak predominantly? I'll answer from my perspective. I, at this point in my life, because of circumstances beyond me, I speak mostly English because everyone else around me who I associate with speaks English. But I'm a first language Lakota speaker. So what is, what is us as native people? If, if your answer is I speak predominantly or only English, then that implies certain realities that you never learned your native language that may be your fault or not. Uh, or if you do speak a native language, if, you, if your answer is still English, then it's because of the circumstances that are occurring because of colonization. This is a consequence of colonization. That's what we're, that's where we're at today in our lives and circumstances as native people, whether you claim it or not, that's what's happening. That's where we're at. And all the factors we talked about cause or are causing that change. We're at this moment here because of the things that happened in the decades, in a century and a half past, and sometimes longer for some of us native groups, some, of, some, of, some native people. And my second question to you is this, how do you treat your elders? How do you treat your elders? I ask that because in probably every native culture on this continent, bar none, from the Arctic and the subarctic and the Great Plains and the Eastern woodlands and the Great Basin and the Southwest Desert and most Mesoamerican, all 12 culture areas on this continent where people lived and indigenous people lived and thrived, elders were revered and they were treated as such every day, day in and day out. And I lived at a time when I was five, six and seven years old where I saw that still happening, where elders were respected and treated with courtesy and respect. Back in those days when I was a child, if there was a gathering and an old woman or an old man got up to talk, then everybody stood up to listen. And that old man or old woman would then say politely, Iotakape or Iotakapo, sit down to be courteous in return. When that whole room full of people showed the respect of standing up because an elder was standing, then the elder respect, responded with just as much respect and said, sit down. You think it's okay, sit down. But I saw that going on. It isn't happening so much now. So those are, those are the two of the factors that we can look at consistently and sort of have some idea what a consequence of colonization is. In our culture, in the Lakota culture, 
the the people who because we didn't there's no word in our language for authority no there isn't neither is a word for wilderness neither is a word for time so in our culture in our societies no one had authority over anyone else in spite of all the the chief's titles that were thrown out chief so-and-so chief sitting bull chief crazy horse we weren't doing that there was non indian historians doing that well, he's a chief, he's a leader, he's the one in charge, he's the one that has the authority. It didn't work that way. But if any, so no one person had absolute authority all the time. But if any one group were looked at or looked upon to be a source of answers, it was the elder. It was the old people, simply because they li had lived life. And contrary to what people would have you believe, in back in the day, back in those old days, before our reservations, especially uh, uh, for sure here in this part of the country, people lived to be 70 and 80, 90 years old because of the healthy lifestyle. So when someone was no longer physically capable of doing the kind of things to contribute to their family and their community and their society, then they became an elder in the eyes of everyone else because of their experience and their knowledge and their wisdom. So though those people, both men and women, were looked to for advice. And while it may have been the old men that would get together and sit in a meeting or council, as it were. There's no doubt that those old men were influenced by their wives and their daughters. Because the influence of females was always constant. So for example, there's a situation arising, there's a problem of some kind. So the adult males decide to take that issue to the council. And so they take it to the council. They ask to speak to the council and they go and they relate what this problem is to those old men sitting there. And those old men listen to what the problem is. And then the, the, the man describes what's going on and the old man said, we'll think about it. We'll think about it. And so they would. They would talk about it, sometimes for days. They would go and talk to their wives. This is what's going on. We need your insight. And they would talk. And then they would come back together. And, and, and when they came back together, generally, they wouldn't say, this is what we have decided we're going to do. None of that. They simply said, this is what we think about this problem. These are alternatives to dealing with that issue, dealing with that problem. And they would lay, lay out those alternatives and the reasons for their thinking. They never said, okay, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that, you're gonna do that. Didn't work that way, only in certain circumstances. So after the old men made their, their, their decision known, then, then a man, a person's sometimes more than one known as the uh, the announcer, the one who would go out and talk, would go among in the village and say, this is what the, the old ones have said. This is what they said they thought about this situation. And, it would, and they didn't tell anybody what to do. They just gave them choices. They gave them advice. And that's why they were revered because they had the weight of years. They had the weight of experience and they had the insight of knowledge. So that's why I'm asking the question, how do you treat your elders? Unfortunately, this society puts elders out to pasture. They're, we're, we're, we're of no use anymore because we're not young and strong, athletic and vibrant anymore. Physically, we can't keep up with you all, but maybe just maybe some of us 
have gained a little bit of knowledge. And maybe we might have some, some wisdom about some, not everything, but something. So that's one of the reasons I, 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 I took this invitation, not because I think I know anything, because I don't when it comes down to it. Because it's, it's because it's an opportunity to, to cause or create some awareness. And I hope, I hope we've done that for you to some extent and maybe get you to thinking, get you to think about what it is that we have to contend with as Native people. So we'll leave it at that. And, and we'll get together in, uh, what's the next time on the 19th? Or yep, the one week from today. One week from today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be here, not maybe not here at this place physically, but I'll be in front of my computer. Uh, and we'll do this again. So I thank you for being such a wonderful audience, even though I can't see all of your faces. Uh, I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the opportunity. And you take care of yourselves. And uh, I'll see you the next time. And we want to thank you. I think I'm speak on behalf of everyone else in the in the meeting. Thank you for your time and your knowledge and sharing what you do know. My pleasure. And, um, I also want to thank our supporters, South Dakota Humanities Council, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Bush Foundation for sponsoring the Winter Camp series. And thank you all for being here. You can register for next Saturday's uh, meeting on our Facebook page and uh, um, just join me in thanking Mr. Marshall and um, have a great weekend. Thank you.